بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So we were discussing the conquest of Mecca and today inshallah we will finally conclude uh, the conquest of Mecca talking about some of the benefits and some of the uh, morals that we can derive but before we get to that obviously we still have to wrap up some of the incidents that uh, we still haven't discussed and uh, I think the last thing we mentioned was the series of converts who converted right after the conquest those who were delayed in converting and we have just one or two left of those stories um, and the first of them uh, it's just a simple story uh, about the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu a female cousin, one of the daughters of Abu Talib and a full sister of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Her name was Umm Hane. Her name was Umm Hane and she had embraced Islam at the conquest. So she obviously knows the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi since his childhood but she has remained on her faith until the conquest of Mecca and uh, her in-laws, her husband's relatives, uh, had a problem with Ali ibn Abi Talib and uh, in the conquest, during the conquest, they uh, fled because they were worried Ali would extract revenge. This is a story not related to uh, Islam itself. And so they fled. Then they had nowhere to flee, so they sent a message to Umm Mihani, can you protect us from Ali? So they came to the house of Umm Mihani and Umm Mihani is of course the full sister of Ali. And so she locked the door on Ali ibn Abi Talib and allowed the two to remain in her house. Ali became enraged. How dare you come between me and them? And he threatened to harm them. And uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, threatened to harm them. So Umm Mihani, the next morning after they were protected, Umm Mihani went directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because she was a cousin, she was let into the tent or the chambers. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taking a ghusl. He was taking a bath. And his daughter Fatima was standing with a cloth shielding him. Of course they didn't have showers in those days, of course they didn't have separate facilities. If somebody wanted to take a shower, uh, typically you would get somebody to hold a curtain and you would go to a corner of the tent and quickly take a ghusl. So Fatima was holding uh, a curtain in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, the Prophet said, who is this? And obviously he's taking a shower. So Umm Mihani said, this is Umm Mihani. And so he lowered the, the curtain to see her and this is his cousin. So he said, Marhaban bi Umm Hani. Welcome. After so many years, welcome Umm Hani. And Umm Hani gave the entire story that Ya Rasulullah, now she's a Muslim, Ya Rasulullah, I wanted to protect my brother in law, my, my whatnot, and Ali promised he's going to threaten to, to harm them, and I've come to you directly to appeal to you. So the Prophet said, We shall protect anybody whom you want to protect. Uh, we shall protect anybody whom you want to protect. And the, of course, the story is interesting for two reasons. Number one, uh, from this scholars of fiqh have derived that what we talked about aman or protection is given from anybody to anybody. Everybody in the Muslim community, man, woman, child, free, slave, everybody has the right to give a personal aman, a personal protection. And when Umm Mihani gave her personal protection, the Prophet, and this is a very lax law by the way, imagine this is the laws of Islam. Any Muslim has the right to offer protection to any individual. And of course, this is in a state of war uh, when Islamic Sharia is applicable. So any person can say, so-and-so is under my protection. And all of the Muslims have to then obey that protection. It's a very open system. And it is unprecedented in classical times. So the Prophet said, we shall give you protection to whomever you want to protect. And then after he finishes the ghusl, this is an interesting hadith in a fiqh point, not related to the conquest of Mecca. Umm Mihani said, I saw him pray eight raka'at of salat al-duha. I saw him pray eight raka'at of salat al-duha. And this is the only hadith that mentions the Prophet ﷺ praying Salat al-Duha even though it was a regular habit of his but he would pray it in the privacy of his house and his wives for some reason did not report the details they expected or understood this the only narration we have of the Prophet ﷺ himself praying and how many rak'at he prayed is this one and that is Umm Mihani and of course the blessings of Salat al-Duha when is Salat al-Duha who can tell me? when is Salat al-Duha? after Fajr half an hour? After shuruq, before sunrise, before dhuhr. <laughs> so after shuruq, up until right before dhuhr, right? 
No, no, this is, you're talking very specific time. The general time of Salat al-Duha, after shuruq, after the sun has gone to a meter's length, it begins and it lasts all the way until right before dhuhr by 5-10 minutes, right? So, you know, every Salat chart has ishraq time. This is when duha begins. And from ishraq time, it will last all the way up until the, the, the right before Salat al-Dhuhr. And this is at least three and a half to five and a half hours, depending on the time of the year. Correct? Three and a half to five and a half hours. And our Prophet ﷺ said, the best time to pray is when the heat begins to strike you. Which, let's say, will be 11.30 or so. That's the best time to pray. But you can pray it at any time. And you can pray two or four or six or eight. All of this is allowed. And in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah said, whoever prays four rak'at in the beginning of the day, I will suffice him till the end of the day. So, four is the minimum of perfection. Two is the minimum allowed. In fact, it's sunnah, it's nafil, so you can do anything. You don't have to pray duha. You can pray two raka'ah. Four is the minimum of perfection. And eight is what the Prophet ﷺ would typically pray. He would typically pray eight raka'at of Salat al-Duha. And this hadith is interesting because it's the only hadith that we learn about his praying Salat al-Duha. He encouraged us to pray it, but we don't know how much he prayed until we get to the hadith of Umm Hani. So this is uh, one more conversion. The final conversion story before we move on to tie up some other loose ends and then talk about the benefits and the lessons of the conquest of Mecca. The final conversion story involves the official poet of the Quraysh, whose name we have not come across up until now, and his name was Abdullah Az-Za'bari from the tribe of Banu Sahm. And the Sahmi tribe was within one of the tribes of the Quraysh. The Banu Sahm was one of the many tribes of the Quraysh. And the official poet of the Quraysh was Abdullah Az-Za'bari. And he would be the one who wrote poems against Islam and the Muslims before Badr, after Badr, before Uhud, after Uhud. He was the one who had a one-on-one -on -one with Hassan ibn Thabit. He would write, Hassan would reply. He would write, Hassan would reply. So the two of them are going back and forth, right? He was the one that when a poem came, the Prophet told Hassan, go and respond and Jibreel is with you. This is Abdullah Az-Za'bari, this is the poet, okay? Now, uh, he lived a very quiet life other than poetry, so we don't have much about him in sinus that he's done, even before and after. So this is where his name first surfaces uh, when it comes to his acceptance of Islam. And when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, uh, Abdullah Az-Za'bari fled. He fled to Najran. Najran is in Central Arabia. And he fled with his cousin and his best friend because he did not feel comfortable, obviously, even though his name was not on the list. Still, he felt uncomfortable being uh, around the Prophet and the Muslims. So he fled to uh, Najran. And when he fled, Hassan ibn Thabit gloated. And he wrote a page-long poet poem, which is recorded in Ibn Ishaq, which is the most scathing personal attack against Ibn Zabari. What a coward, he flees to Najran, the whole world curses him, him and his children are cursed till the day of judgment. And it's a very, very harsh poem against Ibn Zabari. And Ibn Zabari, when he heard this poem, when he heard this poem, obviously poetry is the communication of the time. Poetry is how you send your propaganda. Poetry is what happens when you want to communicate and give your... Uh, um, uh, verdicts or you want to smear somebody, use poetry. So Ibn Zabari, when he hears this, in fact, he actually feels depressed because he agrees with the sentiment. He agrees that I fled, I was a coward, and he actually begins to think of the content of the message of Islam. And eventually, in the next few days, he decides to convert to Islam from Najran. He's in Najran. So he packs his belongings and he's going to come back to Mecca right after the conquest, like a week after the conquest. And his cousin says, where are you going? He says, I've decided to convert. His cousin says, we've come all the way here, me and you. Now you're going to abandon me here all alone. They're in a strange land, a strange city, a strange tribe. And now he's going to return back. And Ibn Zabari responds, why should I not convert? Why should I remain with this strange tribe? Should I not go back to my own kith and kin? My own cousin, meaning the Prophet ﷺ, because they were in the end of the day, you know, the same tribe. And he is the best of all mankind. Why should I not go back to my own kith and kin, my cousin and my own abode and house? So he decides to come back. And the Prophet ﷺ is sitting in front of the Kaaba with the Sahaba. In the distance, they see a figure coming. And the Prophet ﷺ said, that is Ibn al-Za'bari. And I see from him the nur of Iman. 
from the distance he's walking, he says, I see from him the light of Iman coming. And so when Ibn Za'bari comes, nobody says anything because the Prophet has already said, I see the nur of Islam. And before uh, the Prophet can say anything, Ibn Za'bari says, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Khalas, right there, he's a Muslim, right? Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka la rasulullah. So he accepts Islam officially and then he says that Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah who guided me to Islam. I was your enemy for so long and I incited through poetry against you. And, and even his language, by the way, I'm translating into, into English, even his language is, it's pregnant with meaning. It's so profound. And, uh, and even when you listen to this translation, I rode on horses and traveled on camels and walked on foot to oppose you. Meaning I did everything I could. My tongue, my efforts were all done to oppose you. And I even fled to Najran to avoid you. But Allah still wanted good for me. This is an amazing, and you really sense genuine Islam. You really sense a genuine embracing of the faith, that the faith that I did everything to oppose you, but still Allah wanted me to accept Islam. And I have now come to you as a Muslim and he has caused me to realize how ignorant I was worshipping that which cannot think. Worshipping a stone that we sacrifice to, we venerate, but the stone or the idol does not even realize it is being worshipped. Alhamdulillah for having guided me to Islam. And so the Prophet welcomed his Islam and told him, Islam wipes away all that you have done in the past. All of the sins you've done are now uh, wiped away and clean. And so Ibn Za'bari for the rest of his life, he composed poem after poem in praise of Islam, in praise of the Prophet Sallallahu as an expiation for what he had done. And uh, for some reason that I don't understand, much of his poetry has been lost, unlike the poetry of Hassan which has been preserved. Maybe because he lived in Mecca and Hassan was in Medina and Allah knows best. I don't understand why, but much of his poetry is lost. We only have uh, fragments of his poetry after Islam. And the scholars such as Al-Qurtubi and others uh, said that he wrote much poetry for the Prophet ﷺ after his Islam and through it he cancelled the evil that he had done before Islam and he was a great poet, Sha'iran Majidan. He was a great poet and it is uh, narrated as well that after one poem that he recited in front of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ took off his uh, cloak and gifted it to him and this is what the poets would honor the most when a leader uh, and of course in this case the Prophet ﷺ gives you his personal cloak. So he gifted him his personal cloak. This was Ibn Za'bari and that is an honor that rarely uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave to anybody and this clearly demonstrates the status of Ibn Za'bari. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ remained in Mecca. Some reports say 15 days, some say 19, some say 20. Bukhari says 19 so we'll stick with that. Ibn Hisham says 15 uh, and uh, Tabari says 20 but uh, Bukhari says 19 days. So we'll stick with Bukhari's report. And uh, he, the question came up, where would he live? Whose house would he occupy? And so Ali wanted to regain the house that he grew up in, which is the house the Prophet grew up in. And that is the house of Abu Talib. Abu Talib. The house of Abu Talib, Ali's house. Right? The Prophet grew up in that house. Uh, as for the house of Khadija, uh, Allah knows best, but uh, people had taken it over after the Prophet left. So the house that remained uh, occupied by the extended family should have been the house of Abu Talib. So Ali said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, why, why aren't you going to go back to our house? Meaning the house he and him, the, the Prophet because Ali's house is his father's house as well. And why don't you go back to our house? And the Prophet said, and did Aqil leave any property for us to live in? Now pause here, we need to explain what, what is this reference to. Abu Talib died, a mushrik, and he had many sons. He had of course, who is his oldest son? This is a trick question. Who is Abu Talib's eldest son? <laughs> Talib, the sister knows. <laughs> Smack yourself in the face. What is what is the acronym for that? S M H. Is that it? Huh? <laughs> Talib. Abu Talib's eldest son is Talib. Don't you all feel smart now? <laughs> okay. So uh, his eldest son is Talib. Uh, Talib and Aqil. After him was Aqil. So those of you said Aqil as the second eldest. These two, when uh, the Prophet was in Mecca, they did not embrace Islam. They did not embrace Islam. Who embraced Islam? 
Ali and Ja'far. These are the four sons. Ali and Ja'far embraced Islam. Okay. Now, when Abu Talib died, Talib and Aqil were not Muslim. Ja'far and Ali were Muslim. So who inherited Abu Talib's house? Talib and Aqil. Talib and Aqil inherited the house. Ja'far and Ali did not get anything. The process of migrates to Mecca. Talib dies. The eldest Talib dies. Aqil decides to sell everything for the money. So he sells all of the property. Now Ali wants it back, but it doesn't belong to him. So he's asking, can't we go in? Like, let me get it back. But the process is a fair, obviously, he's not going to acquire some, somebody else's property. So he then is a bit critical of Aqil. Aqil didn't leave anything for us. If he had left it for us, we would have. But Aqil sold it all. So what this means here, and from this we derive fiqh benefits, that uh, the uh, mushrik is inherited by mushriks. Muslims don't inherit from mushriks. So when Abu Talib died, who inherited? Ali and Ja'far did not get any share of the house. They don't have any right to do anything with it. And the Prophet approved of that because Al Muslim, La Yarithul Kafir, this is a hadith. Then Aqil sold it to somebody, that's a legitimate transaction, and the Prophet has no right to then confiscate that property back. So he's critical of Aqil, like Aqil acted, whatever. He, you know, it's a bit of a disappointment to him. I don't even have a house anymore. Aqil sold it away. Uh, Aqil, by the way, did accept Islam at the conquest. So Aqil becomes a Muslim and he lives a very quiet life. He doesn't really get that much involved in the affairs and he just, you know, passes away without really doing much other than just living a quiet life. But uh, because of this, the Prophet did not have an abode, a house to stay. So what does he do? He sets up a tent in his own city of Mecca. Situation has changed now. He sets up a tent to live in for the next 19 days. And the place that he chooses is the famous mini valley close to the Kaaba, literally five minutes walk away. It's called Al Hujun. And every person in Mecca who lives in Mecca knows where Al Hujun is still to this day. If you tell any Makkawi, any person from Mecca, where's Al Hujun? He'll point, this is Al Hujun. Now, Al Hujun is very symbolic. Al Hujun was the place that the Quraysh gathered together to enact the boycott. This was where they had the secret meeting and they signed the document. Remember the document? Remember the boycott, right? This hujun was where they gathered together to sign the treaty or the document to boycott the, uh, the, the Muslims. And this was the worst that the Quraysh ever did. This was the lowest of the low. And no doubt there is an element of symbolism here that the Prophet is now coming and living in al hujun now he is the highest of the high. And look at how Allah Azza wa Jal tests people and then blesses them. Allah Azza wa Jal tests him through what happened at Al Hujun, and now he is living there as a conqueror, as the undisputed leader of Mecca. So Allah Azza wa Jal demonstrated his perfect justice from where to where. This place was where the worst atrocity the Quraysh ever committed occurred, and now in the same place. Our Prophet is being given the greatest honor. So he lived in Mecca for 19 days and during this period he prayed all of the prayers in the Haram, in the uh, Kaaba, in front of the Kaaba, and he did Qasr for 19 days. He prayed the four rak'at too. We'll get back to this point later on. You obviously understand this causes a huge issue in fiqh. You all understand this point, right? For 19 days he stayed in Mecca and he prayed shortened salah for 19 days. All of the five. But he prayed them on time. So all of the five prayers he prayed them at the right time, but he shortened the four into the uh, two. And this we'll get to in the end when we summarize the fiqh uh, benefits. And during these 19 days he gave many small sermons. He taught the people of Mecca the basics of fiqh that they needed to know. So we have dozens of ahadith reported about what he said in Mecca, most of which deal with teaching the new Muslims their religion of Islam, giving them the rulings of diya, of, of so many things. So we'll summarize some of the things that he taught the, 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 the uh, Muslims in Mecca, the new Muslims, of the first things uh, that uh, he said was he reinstated the sanctity of Mecca. He wanted everybody to understand how holy the city of Mecca is. And of the first speeches he ever gave, 
Perhaps even he gave this on the day of conquest. If not, then the next day after conquest. Well, obviously, we don't have a detailed chronicle of which speech goes when, but one of the earliest speeches he gave, maybe the next morning after the conquest of Mecca, is that he gathered all the people together and he said, Ya ma'ashara nas, O people, Allah has made Mecca sacred. In Allah harrama Mecca. We all call Mecca al-haram. Right? And we have said many times, what does Al-Haram mean? Al-Haram means it is sanctified. Al-Haram means it is holy. Al-Haram means things that are permissible outside of Mecca are not permissible inside of Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has made Mecca sacred. The day that He created the heavens and the earth, and it shall remain sacred until the day of judgment. Mecca is a haram from the beginning of time it shall be a haram till the end of time it is not allowed for any believer who believes in Allah and the last day to shed any blood human or animal you cannot fight in Mecca you cannot hunt in Mecca you cannot shed any blood meaning you cannot even hunt in uh, Mecca and it is not allowed for people to pluck the leaves. So we know even the, the, the plants of Mecca and the trees of Mecca should be left as is. Everything that Allah Azza has put shall remain uh, over there. Then, and he goes on, that Mecca was never halal. When he says halal in this context, it means non-sacred. Mecca was never non-sacred and even for me, uh, sorry, Mecca was never halal before me, nor shall it be halal after me. And even for me, it was made halal just for an hour of the day. Because what did he do? He conquered Mecca. How did he conquer Mecca? By wearing armor. He didn't fight. He didn't, you know, but he did, quote unquote, attack Mecca, didn't he? And it is not allowed to attack Mecca. And for anybody else, obviously. Then he said, Mecca was always sacred before me and it shall be sacred after me. And as for me, Allah lifted its sanctity for me to attack just for one hour of the day. He literally, he said, Sa'atan min nahar. One hour of the day. And now, when this hour is over, it has returned to its sanctity as it was before. So if somebody says, and this is, this is the hadith he's saying, so if somebody says, but the Prophet ﷺ fought in Mecca, or attacked Mecca, or istahalla Mecca, he lifted the sanctity. You respond back to him. This is an amazing hadith. He is telling us, if somebody tells you, I did this, you respond back to him. Allah has made it halal for the Prophet, and he has not made it halal for you. That's the end of the hadith. So, the point is, he's emphasizing to the people of Mecca, the extreme sanctity of the city of Mecca. And that is why some of the Sahaba, some of the companions, they would go to such extremes that even if a pigeon landed on their belongings or on them, they would not even shoo it away. They would not even get rid of it out of sanctity, out of worrying that we are disturbing uh, any creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in uh, Mecca. And Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ يُرِدْ فِيهِ بِإِلْحَادٍ Whoever desires to commit a sin in Mecca, just desiring, وَمَنْ يُرِدْ Whoever desires to cause fitna and fasad, to cause problems in Mecca, Allah says we will give him a punishment. So merely intending to harm the city of Mecca brings about Allah's uh, wrath. So this is one of the things that he, uh, he decreed uh, uh, in the early stages of the conquest. Also, of the things that he decreed as well, uh, and the famous hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah and His Messenger forbid you from selling alcohol, and selling carcasses, and selling idols. Now where did this thing come about from? So obviously of the first prohibitions in Mecca is what? No idolatry and no drinking. Okay, every house in Mecca is going to have idols and drink. And drink. Obviously, every house in Mecca is going to have alcohol and every house in Mecca is going to have idols. In fact, the people of Mecca had a very lucrative business. What was the business? They would just take any wood, any stone, paint it and make an idol, then sell it to the people that came from outside of Mecca. Why? An idol from Mecca would give prestige to the idol. Right? So quite literally, they would gather some wood or gather some stone, paint it and whatnot, and then sell it. Right? So um, an idol from Mecca is going to go for a higher market value, isn't it? So, so, many, so, many, years. so many. So many what? So many years, so, so many years from Mecca. Souvenir from Mecca, yes, it's a, it's a shirk souvenir from Mecca. Okay. So uh, the people of Mecca had a lucrative business selling idols to the 
innocent pilgrims and hujaj, the, the Bedouins coming, and the Prophet ﷺ forbade them. You have lots of idols stocked up, you have lots of, of khamr. So they said, so the Prophet ﷺ said, you cannot worship the idol, you cannot drink alcohol. So what did they do? They began to offer it for cheap. Get rid of it. So the Prophet ﷺ then said, Allah and His Messenger forbid you from selling that which you cannot you know, do. And there's another hadith that says, when Allah has forbidden something, Allah has forbidden you to sell it to others. You see, we have a clear sharia, a simple law here. If something's not right for you, it's not right for somebody else. If you're not allowed to drink, you can't have an alcohol store and sell it to somebody else. Say, oh, I'm not drinking alcohol. No, if it's not good for you, it's not good for somebody else. We don't have this type of stuff that, oh, it's not allowed for me, but I can give it over to you. Generally speaking, generally speaking, and there are some minor exceptions, for example, silk, because silk is halal, let's say, uh, for the women and whatnot. But uh, generally speaking, alcohol and, and uh, idols are the two biggest examples. These items are impermissible to use, to acquire, to sell. They are not allowed for any Muslim to get involved with. And so they had to destroy the idols, literally smash them up. And they had to pour the alcohol into the streets because they're not allowed to sell to other people. And this is uh, something that was adopted in Mecca. And after this now, it is a standard part of fiqh. All of the students of fiqh, when you're studying fiqh, you learn this principle. That which is haram to use and benefit from is haram to sell to others. This is a principle of fiqh. If you're not allowed it, you're not allowed to sell it to others. And we, where do we get this from? Conquest of Mecca. Also in the conquest of Mecca, another prohibition as well. Uh, and this was the prohibition of Zawaj Mut'a. Zawaj Mut'a. Now, we know what Zawaj Mut'a is. You don't know. You want me to tell you what it is? You know very well what it is, Yaqi. You, you know very well. You were the one saying, why isn't it halal? I remember last time. <laughs> okay. So, Zawaj Mut'a. Uh, now, Zawaj Mut'a is a controversial issue, as you know, uh, between the Sunni and the Shia uh, groups. And uh, from the perspective of Sunni Islam, uh, Mut'a, by and large, most, the bulk, almost ijma' of the Sunnis, uh, is that it is not allowed. Uh, and there is a controversy, when was it prohibited? So Imam al-Nawawi and other scholars say it was allowed twice and prohibited twice. So it used to be halal. Then in the battle of Khaybar, it was made haram. Then it was made halal again. Then in the battle of Mecca, or the conquest of Mecca, excuse me, it was made haram again. So this is one opinion. And other scholars, such as Ibn al-Qayyim, are very much opposed to this opinion. And they say, no, it was made haram, and it was only made haram once, and it was made haram in the conquest of Mecca. So the both of them agree it was made haram. It's just a matter of... Halal, haram, 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 you know, once or twice uh, of this nature. Um, and, uh, of course, as you know, uh, non-Sunni groups, they don't accept these prohibitions. And it is even attributed to Ibn Abbas, and Allah knows best uh, about this position. But by and large, the standard Sunni schools all adopted these uh, prohibitions. Of the fiqh that we learned as well from the conquest of Mecca. And by the way, a lot of these things are known to you. But most of you didn't know they occurred in the conquest of Mecca. Of the things that all of you know sitting here, but I don't think many of you knew that occurred in the conquest of Mecca, was the famous ruling in Islam that you are all familiar with, that you're only allowed to leave one third of your money outside of your will. Outside of the people that Allah has allocated shares to. As we all know in Islamic law, you have to give your uh, money according to the chart in the Quran, according to the fractions in the Quran. The wife, the son, the daughter, the husband, they all get shares in the Quran. What if you have a friend, a distant uncle, a cousin? What if you have somebody who's a benefactor? How do you benefit them in your will? We know, we all know, the maximum you can give is how much? One third. Where do we get this from? Right here and now. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas fell ill. And he thought he was about to die. Even the Prophet and the, uh, so, so and the Muslims thought he's about to die. Seriously ill. And he's on, he thought he's on his deathbed. Turns out he's going to live another, mashallah, decade and a half. But he thought he's on his deathbed. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has blessed me with lots of money. And I only have two daughters. So what if I give two thirds of my wealth to people that I want to? The Prophet said, no, too much. So he said, okay, how about half of it? And still the Prophet said, no, too much. So he said, how about one third? Then he said, a thuluthu wa thuluthu kathir. Okay, one third, but even one third you're pushing it. It's okay, but one third you're pushing it. Then he said, were you to leave your descendants, your heirs, rich, it is better than you leave them poor, having to beg others for help. These are your daughters, these are your family. 
It's better you on the generous side with them rather than other people. So from this hadith, we all know the famous rule, and we all practice this rule, that you're only allowed to give a maximum of one-third to people outside of the list found in the Qur'an. And this also occurs in the uh, story of, or in the conquest of Mecca. Uh, another uh, fiqh point that uh, involves a famous hadith that you're all familiar with, this was also the famous uh, incident that you have all read and heard about when one of the women of the tribe of Banu Makhzum, the Banu Makhzum tribe is the tribe of Abu Jahl, it's the tribe that's a very famous tribe. One of the women of the tribe of Banu Makhzum was caught stealing. And they spoke to Usama ibn Zayd, who was the beloved of the Prophet ﷺ. Usama ibn Zayd, because his father was Zayd, uh, and his mother is Ummi Ayman, and Usama was physically born in the house of the Prophet in Mecca. Usama has grown up uh, as a baby, as a young man. The Prophet ﷺ loves him immensely. He loved his father. His mother took care of the Prophet ﷺ as a baby. So this is, Usama is called the beloved of the Prophet ﷺ, Hibbun Nabi, the one whom the Prophet ﷺ loved. So the the men of the Banu Makhzum, they went to Usama because they knew he, he, the Prophet has a soft spot for him. And they kind of convinced him, why don't you just suggest to the Prophet to forgive this lady? She is a noble lady from amongst us and, you know, just uh, for, let, let the punishment go. So Usama entered in and asked the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, she is a very famous and noble lady, why don't you just let her go? So the Prophet he became enraged and he said, أَتَشْفَعُ فِي حَدِّ مِنْ حُدُودِ اللَّهِ You want to intercede when it comes to a had of the hudud of Allah, you want to intercede? And then he said the famous line that we're all familiar with, that Wallahi, Wallahi لَوْ فَاطِمَ بِنْتِ مُحَمَّدْ سَرَقَتْ لَقَطَعْتُ يَدَهَا my own daughter, if she committed this crime, I would not forgive her. It's not, we don't operate this way that the rich and famous get off the hook and the poor and the lowly will be punished, right? So, and he gave and he called all of the people of Mecca. That's another khutbah that he gave. And in front of all of them, he said that if my own daughter, Fatima binti Muhammad, committed a crime, then I would establish the punishment on her. I'm not going to forgive somebody just because they're rich and wealthy. And the Maghzumiya was a rich and wealthy lady. And so the, the relatives wanted to do that. For Aisha narrated that this lady after the punishment uh, was done, this lady would regularly visit me afterwards and she would petition the Prophet for other matters of hers and I would raise her petitions to the Prophet to grant her to grant her, her requests. And this also shows us, this interesting tidbit, this also shows us that once the punishment has been done, once a person has been punished, you're not treated like a criminal for the rest of your life. Once you've done your time, once you have been punished, then khalas, okay, end of story, move on. So the same lady who was caught stealing, she also continues to ask the Prophet for other favors and she gets those favors. Because you're allowed to petition and ask for favors when you're not breaking the law. But the first petition was trying to break the law just for her. And in our religion, we are allowed to intercede for noble causes. We're not allowed to intercede when it comes to protecting uh, those who should not be protected. Also, one of the fiqh rulings, um, very uh, not quite that important in our times, uh, but the general ruling is relevant. Um, and that is, there was the case of a child that was born in dubious circumstances. I.e., you understand some type of affair was alleged. And the person who was involved in all of this, of course, so this child is born, there is a married couple, and somebody alleges that this child is mine. Now, now this occurred before Islam, by the way. So, all of these crimes and sins are occurring before Islam. Now, the both of these are famous Muslims. And as we know, Islam forgives all previous sins, so we should not think bad of them. This is all happening in the past. And uh, the two people involved were Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, and Abdullah ibn Zum'ah, the both of them are famous Sahaba. Sa'ad said, this child is mine. And Abdullah ibn Zum'ah was married to the lady who gave birth. And so he's saying, the child is born in my marriage. So they complain now, now that they conquer Mecca. Now this child is now a young boy. Uh, and so they're both contesting who should have custody of the child. So the Prophet ﷺ gave the famous verdict, Al-waladu lil-firash. This is a famous hadith that every student of fiqh studies. Al-waladu lil-firash. Which metaphorically translates, well literally it translates, the child is to the bed it was born on. And metaphorically this means, any time a child is born, 
we shall assume without question that the child belongs to the parents who are married. Al-waladu lil-firash. We don't delve into rumor and whatnot. We don't do qila wa qal. You understand? We simply base it on the verdict of who's married. Al-waladu lil-firash. The child will be given to the bed it was born on, meaning whoever was married, we will consider. And if somebody is proven to be an adulterer, then they will be punished uh, with the punishment of adultery. So this is the verdict of Islam, that when a child is born, we do not question. Anybody says anything, we don't, we don't question it. We try to cover up faults and sins. We don't pry and we don't probe. And we assume children belong to the parents that gave birth to them. Al-waladu lil-firash. This is a famous ruling in Islam as well. Now, this is another issue. Let's not get involved in this right now. Uh, now, um, one of the main effects of the conquest of Mecca one of the main effects, what happened after the conquest of Mecca? You see, Arabia, as we all know, was disunited. Arabia did not have a central government. And each tribe has its own mini province, mini city. So, the conquest of Mecca is taken as a symbolic conquest of the central nervous system of Arabia. And the other tribes, and this is well documented in many books of Tafsir and Hadith and Seerah, the other tribes who did not get involved in the conflict between the Quraysh and the Prophet ﷺ, were waiting to see who wins. Al-Qurtu and others, they explicitly mentioned this, that uh, the other tribes were waiting to see what happens. That if the Prophet ﷺ eventually conquers Mecca, this is an indication that there is no stopping him and we must embrace Islam. And one of them remarked, as Al-Khurtubi mentions, that Allah had protected Mecca from the people of the elephant. You all know Ashab Al-Feed, right? That Allah protected Mecca from the people of the elephant. So if Allah allows this man to conquer it, well, what does that show then? It shows he's a prophet. So there's a theological symbolism given by the people of Mecca to the conquest of, sorry, by the Arabs, not the people of Mecca, by the Arabs who are not Qurashi, by the people who are in central, in south, in, uh, in far north, the entire Arabian Peninsula is subservient to the, to the city of Mecca when it comes to holiness. There is no other competition. And everybody considers Mecca to be the bastion of their race. Father of Ibrahim and Ismail, right? Adnan, all of them, they go back to Mecca. So the heritage that they all have with Mecca, the association they have with Mecca, the conquest of Mecca translated for them the victory of Islam over paganism. And therefore when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, this is when tribes that were neutral so far, and whose names we have not even come across because they did not get involved, they began from now up until the death of the Prophet ﷺ, began sending delegations that they have converted. And this is exactly what Allah says in the Quran, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا You will see people embrace Islam like armies coming. They're not coming to attack, they're coming to uh, embrace. And uh, therefore, with the conquest of Mecca, the Arabs one by one, the tribes one by one, even the majority of whom, and this is a very interesting point here. Look, our Prophet ﷺ did not fight over 90% of the Arabs of his time. He's only fighting the Quraysh and the few tribes that allied themselves with the Quraysh. Like Hawaz and like Thaqif and whatnot. How about the rest of Arabia? How about Central Arabia? How about South Arabia? How about Far North? How about the Eastern and Western provinces? Nothing. There is no direct battle. How did they embrace Islam? See, this was the wisdom of choosing the grandson of Abdul Muttalib to be the Prophet. This is the wisdom of choosing somebody with the most impeccable lineage. You cannot compete with the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. You cannot compete with somebody born and raised in Mecca. With somebody who has the symbolic victory of the Kaaba, the literal victory of the Kaaba. You cannot compete with this person. So Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah knows, as Allah says in the Quran, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. Allah knows whom He's going to make His Prophet. Allah chooses. Allahu yastafi min al malaki rusula. Allah chooses from the man, from people who will be uh, the prophets. So Allah chose this man for a reason. Allah chose our Prophet for a reason. And of the most obvious reasons, his lineage, his city, his circumstance, nobody could say anything about 
him wanting more higher status, more higher power, he's coming from the best of the best. And he's coming from the cream of the crop. And he's coming from the holiest of all cities. Now he comes back to his own city. He's not conquering a strange land. That's another point here. Imagine how the Arabs would have felt if another tribe conquered Mecca. Here's another reason here. He is Makkawi. He's from Mecca. This is his city. His own people have expelled him. Now he comes back and he conquers his own city, which happens to be the holiest city on earth. And the Mecca and the Quran and the Arabs all agree to this. So now with this conquest, and they all know for 15 years he's been battling his people. They all have been watching on the sidelines. Now with the victory of the Prophet over, over the conquest of Mecca, this is when the people began to embrace Islam. And from this point onwards, there is a non-stop trick of tribes sending delegations. Inshallah in 2-3 weeks we'll talk about the what is called the year of delegations. What is the year of delegations? The next year and the year after this. Two years actually to be, to be more precise. Some people say it's only the ninth year. No, it is in fact from the 8th all the way to the 10th year. The next two years are called the year of delegations. Why? Because every second, third day a new delegation would arrive from another tribe embracing Islam. No conquest, no army sent. No, It's just literally people are realizing this is the uh, truth. And it is truly an amazing miracle that Paganism is eliminated completely from an entire land. Hundreds of thousands of people. Paganism no longer exists anywhere in the Arabian Peninsula. And all of this is done in the span of less than 15 years. This is what Allah has predicted in the Quran. You will see people embrace Islam uh, like armies. And of course, Surah Al-Nasr, all of you know Surah Al-Nasr. And it's an interesting story about uh, Surah Al-Nasr as well. That... Later on, many years later, in the caliphate of Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, Umar would have a, a senior meeting with the elders of the Quraysh, the elders of the, well, the elders of the Muslims, Ansar and Qurashi. And the youngest person to be admitted was Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet So some of the other, and he was at this time probably 15 years old, 17, 15, 16, 17 years old. And the other Sahaba objected and they said, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, O leader of the faithful, we have sons older than him. And you don't allow them to come to this gathering. Why are you allowing this man to come? So Ibn Abbas narrates the hadith. Hadith is in Bukhari. He narrates it himself. Ibn Abbas says, One day Umar called me. And I, I think he called me just to test me. And when all of the people were gathered, he asked them, Can you explain to me? Which translates as uh, that when you see the victory of Allah, when you see the blessings of Allah, the conquest of Allah come, and people begin to embrace Islam like armies, at that point in time, Praise your Lord and glorify Him and seek His forgiveness. Verily, He is oft forgiving and merciful. So this is a, this, a surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Nasr. Now, Umar asked them, explain this to me. Some people offered this explanation, others gave generic, Allah is saying when He blesses you, thank Him for the blessings. Then Umar turned to Ibn Abbas, the youngest, 15 year old, 17 year old kid. And, and Ibn Abbas is the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. And he asks him, you interpret it. Ibn Abbas says, they have not spoken correctly. The elders are not, this is not right. Rather, and this is the tafsir, interesting tafsir. Rather, Allah is informing the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ that when Mecca is conquered, your time on earth is about to come to an end. So prepare to meet Allah by increasing your worship and seeking His forgiveness. Verily, Allah is forgiving and merciful. And Umar said, this is the only knowledge I have of the surah, meaning you have spoken all that I know. So, Surah Al-Nasr is the beginning of the end. Surah Al-Nasr tells us for the very first time, death is close by. You have reached your pinnacle. You have the conquest of Mecca. You only have a short time left. And Ibn Abbas understood from Surah Al-Nasr that our Prophet Muhammad is being told, death is near. Now you have achieved the, and this shows us the importance of the conquest. Quite literally, the conquest is the pinnacle. That's it. 
You have now reached at the high point and you just have to wrap up a few last things before Allah will cause your mission on earth to come to an end. So he's being told this and as we know, barely two years after this, our Prophet ﷺ uh, passed away. Also by the way, from this surah, think about it my dear brothers and sisters, our Prophet Muhammad ﷺ being who he is and Allah tells him to prepare for meeting me by extra worship and extra istighfar. How about me and you? Are we ready to meet our Lord? How about me and you? Where's our istighfar and where's our worship? Our Prophet Muhammad is the best human being, the most generous, the, the least sinful. He is told, istighfirhu. He is told, sabbih bihamdi rabbik. To prepare for death. So we as well had better take a lesson and heed and increase in our worship and increase in our istighfar. And we never know when our death will come. Our Prophet was given some premonition. We will not get that premonition. He was given some hints. We obviously will not get those uh, hints. So uh, this is Surah An Nasr. Now he stayed, as we said, 19 days in Mecca. Uh, what else did he do during these uh, days? So he sent a number of mini expeditions uh, around Mecca. Primarily to invite the neighboring tribes to Islam and to destroy the major centers of idolatry. So there's two types of idols. There's the personal home idol and then there's the idol that is the temple idol. There's an idol in a temple. This is the public idol that people go to. As for the idols in your homes, he gives a general command, everybody destroy your own idol, get rid of them. As for the temple idols, he will send people to get rid of those. As for the idols that are venerated uh, you know, out in public, so he sends a number of sahaba to get rid of the most largest and the most famous idols around uh, Mecca. And uh, he sent Khalid ibn al-Walid to destroy al-Uzza. And of course al-Uzza is mentioned in the Quran. Also he sent a delegation or a group to destroy al-Manat. Also Suwa. All of these famous idols close and around uh, Mecca. And it is uh, reported that when Khalid arrived at the temple of al-Uzza, and of course there were the, what do you want to call them, the the um, the people who take care of the idols or the uh, the the custodians of the idols or the clergy of the of the pagans, I mean, whatever term you use for them, there were those people there when they saw Khalid coming and they realized what would happen, one of them flung an axe around the neck of Al-Uzza and said, Oh Uzza, you protect yourself, I have to flee. <laughs> so they all left and Al-Uzza did not protect itself and Khalid destroyed uh, Al-Uzza. So uh, within the span of a few days, basically all of the idols in the vicinity of the Hijaz, in the area of the Hijaz region, were all destroyed. Now, all of this greatness was marred by a mini tragedy, but it was not something our Prophet Sassim did, it was a mistake done by one of the companions. It was a tragedy, a mini tragedy, and it was, uh, and this also shows us that SubhanAllah, humans are always prone to error. No matter how much greatness you have, there's always going to be some, some marring, some deficiencies. Right in this world, there is no perfection. This is the greatest time of the uh, of the religion of Islam. Still, something trivial is going to happen that mars this. But it wasn't from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was a mistake made by Khalid ibn al Walid. Now remember, Khalid ibn al Walid. When did he convert? Just before. Just before. He's a brand new Muslim, right? So he makes a very very serious mistake, and this mistake hurt our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and. He had to personally apologize to the people involved and uh, and make up for it. And it is uh, a mistake that involves uh, one of the tribes that so Khalid is sent on a number of expeditions, right? One after the other. Do the, he has a checklist basically. He has a checklist. Do this. Do this. Do this. Now, one of the items on the checklist was uh, to go to the tribe uh, of the Banu Jadima which is a day's distance away from Mecca, and as well invite them to Islam. Now, generally speaking. All of the tribes around Mecca embraced Islam because it's understood with Mecca there is no point opposing idolatry. Now, Khalid ibn al Walid had a personal history with the tribe of Banu Jadima. In the days of Jahiliyyah, this tribe had killed his uncle and there was some blood between the two of them. So, when Khalid now appears on the horizon with an army behind him, what did the Banu Jadima think? They thought war, they thought attack. So the Banu Jadima initially, a group of them took out their swords and they led an attack. This led Khalid to attack. And he was a new Muslim and he made a very big mistake which is that 
when other members of the tribe, now obviously if you're attacked, you're going to attack back, but other members understood what's going on and they announced their submission to Islam. They announced, no, we, we have, we're along with the rest of the people. And we know in our religion, we know this from Ali ibn Abi Talib's story of the man who spat on him and then, we all know this, right? Even on the battlefield, you give up right then and there. If somebody says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ashhadu Rasulullah, right then and there, we, we all know the story of Ali ibn Abi Talib with the sword pulled out and the man at the very end, uh, he does this, right? And he still, and the story of Usama ibn Zayd, we talked about this as well, that the man who embraced Islam right at the very end and Usama still ended up killing him in the process and became so angry at him and said, did you open up his heart and did you see why? Are you in charge of, uh, of his heart? Now Khalid didn't know any of this stuff. Khalid did not know any of this. He's a brand new Muslim, he put, put in charge. So when, uh, he, when a group attacked, he attacked back and he attacked according to the customs of Jahiliyyah, which is no mercy. No mercy. You attack me, end of story. We're going to kill all of you. Now, he didn't end up killing all of them, but he did kill a lot of innocent people. He ordered the other Sahaba to attack. And the other Sahaba said, no, we're not going, the senior Sahaba. Amongst them, Abdullah ibn Umar. Amongst them, Abdurrahman ibn Auf. They disobeyed a leader. Because in Islam, you're only allowed to obey a leader when he commands you that which is allowed. Right? And this is a, a clear instance of them disobeying a leader. And he got irritated at them that I am your training commander. Right? Even though they were senior to him in Islam, but because he was militarily senior, you understand he was appointed as a military leader. He said, I'm your commander. And Ibn Auf said, no, I'm not going to uh, attack. And so he became angry at Abd al-Rahman ibn Auf and he uh, gave him a vile uh, curse and whatnot. And one of the causes for confusion as well appears to be that the tribe of Banu uh, uh, Jadima did not say the appropriate phrases even. They didn't say, Aslamna. They said, Saba'na, Saba'na. Now, if you remember from our Meccan class, the Arabs would consider the new religion of Islam to be Sabianism. Asabi'un. And they would call Islam Saba'ta. Uh, you, have, you have embraced Sabianism. Right? So they would call Islam Sabianism. So this group said Saba'na, Saba'na. And the other senior companions understood the reference and they didn't do anything. But Khalid ibn al-Walid, already angered because of the attack, did not take this into account. He didn't understand, he didn't know the sanctity of, 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 of this, so he did end up killing some of the people who should not have been killed. Immediately, news reached back to the Prophet wasallam, and this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, it's well known, these are all well known hadith. The first thing the Prophet did, he stood up, he faced the Kaaba, he raised his hands and he said, Allahumma inni abra'u laika bima fa'ala Khalid. Oh Allah, I absolve any responsibility for what Khalid has done, I didn't command him to do that. Oh Allah, I didn't command him to do that, that's basically what he's saying. Oh Allah, I absolve myself of the actions of Khalid ibn al-Walid. I did not command him to uh, do that. And he sent Ali immediately to resolve the issue. And he gave Ali uh, a large amount of, of wealth to uh, give the blood money, the compensation money to those who had been killed. And so Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, went to resolve the issue and he gave very generously to each and every person. He apologized on behalf of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, when uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf came back, he complained to the Prophet Sallallahu as well about what Khalid had done and he listed for him what he had said Khalid and you remember Khalid is a new Muslim remember this right so he Islam and the etiquettes of Islam still haven't been taught to him so Abd al-Rahman ibn Auf who is one of the earliest converts he complains to the Prophet and the Prophet gives that famous hadith that all of us know La tasubbu ashabi do not curse my companions for wallahi if one of you were to give the mountain of Uhud in gold as charity, you would not be equivalent to what one of them gave with a handful or even half of a handful. Now, this hadith, we always quote it, and this is our reason for respecting the companions. But, who is it being said to? Khalid ibn al-Walid. It's being said to Khalid ibn al-Walid, another sahabi. 
And Khalid ibn al-Wadid is being told, you had better not curse the senior companions. Because if you were to give the mountain of Uhud in gold, it would not be equivalent to half of what they gave. If this is Khalid, where do we stand on that scale? Think about that. If this is Khalid being told that you cannot reach Abd al-Rahman ibn Auf, you cannot reach Abu Bakr and Umar, you cannot reach Uthman and Ali, imagine where do we stand on that scale, right? So the context of this hadith actually makes us respect the Sahaba even more. Even more. Because it is being said to a brand new companion, which is Khalid ibn Walid. And we know Khalid ibn Walid, even though he's a brand new companion, he is still a highly respected companion. Eventually he becomes yani, a very respected Sahabi. But at this point in time, he's brand new and he's being told, do not curse my uh, companions. And uh, as we said, so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, remained in Mecca for all of these days. And uh, the main point here is that he consolidated the immediate vicinity, but there was one major center left close by. And that major center we'll talk about, inshallah, in our next lesson. We're going to finish up with the, with the benefits of the, the incident of Mecca. What is the next major city? Ta'if. And Ta'if was the city that had expelled him. Ta'if was the city that had tortured him. Ta'if was the city that had pelted him with stones. Ta'if was the city he had the opportunity to destroy if Allah, uh, Allah gave him that opportunity and he forgave. Now, Ta'if could not be attacked with an army. Even though he had 12,000 men, Ta'if was a difficult city to attack. And we'll talk about the reasons for this next time. But briefly, because it's on the top of a mountain, it's on a plateau. It's on a plateau. It's difficult to get there. Once you're there, they have a thick fortress. They have rainfall. They have plenty of water. They have vegetation. They can last out a siege. And up until this point in time, the Muslims have not developed any way of getting past a fortress. They don't have the mechanisms, the weapons. They don't have uh, the weapons to destroy thick fortresses. Remember in Khaybar, they had to literally wait it out. In Khaybar, remember, they literally just had to wait out. But in Khaybar, they could cut off the uh, supplies, but in, in, in Ta'if they cannot do this. So Ta'if will represent a big challenge, so we will uh, finish up with some of the benefits of uh, the, the, the benefits of the conquest of Mecca, but the next lesson is going to be Hunayn and uh, Ta'if, and we will inshallah do that in our next lesson. Let us conclude by summarizing some of the fiqh benefits and then the primary uh, theological benefits from the conquest of Mecca. As for the fiqh benefits derived from the conquest of Mecca, they are numerous and we'll only list maybe around 15 of them. Actually, there are much more than this. Number one of the fiqh benefits derived from the conquest of Mecca, it is allowed to break your fast during Ramadan for a legitimate reason. Where do we get this from? Where do we derive this from? When did they break their fast? When they left Medina, it was the month of Ramadan, and they broke their fast. All of them. None of them were fasting. And it is the month of Ramadan. And it is the eighth year of the Hijrah. When was Ramadan ob obligated? Second year. So Ramadan is now an established faridah. But in the eighth year, when they go for the conquest of Mecca, all of them break their fast, right? So that's one fiqh benefit. You're allowed to break your fast in a travel. We all know this. Another fiqh benefit. Traveling begins outside of your home city, not outside of your home. <laughs> Traveling begins outside of your home city, not outside of your home. When did they break, the, where did they break their fast? Outside of Dhul Hulayfa. They did not break it when they left their houses. So, in our times, where does Qasr start? And when can you break the fast? Not when you leave for the airport, not even in Memphis airport, not even when you're driving down I-40 or whatever, when you're getting out of the city, only when you symbolically leave the city. When you feel that there's enough distance now that okay, I have left the city limits. And of course in our times, it's like a guesstimation, you get a, a rough idea, you use your common sense and judgment here. When you leave the city limits, then you can break the fast, then you can pray Qasr. You cannot break the fast in the morning of Ramadan when your flight's at 4 p.m., no. You can break your fast after the flight takes off and you leave the city if you want to, you can. Even though it's 4 p.m., a few hours left, but anyway, besides the point. It's up to you if you want to or not, you're allowed to do that. So traveling begins when? outside the city. Okay, the next fiqh point. 
Salat al-Duha should be eight rak'ah, that's perfect. But because it's a nafil salah, it doesn't matter. Two rak'ah, four rak'ah, six rak'ah, but eight rak'ah is the perfection. And this is the sunnah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next point, it is recommended for the musafir, for the traveler, to pray all four rak'ah prayers as two rak'ahs. Asr. This is encouraged. And it is strongly encouraged. In fact, one can say it is very strongly encouraged. How do we know this? Because our Prophet ﷺ is in the holiest of holy places, where every single prayer is equivalent to a hundred thousand other prayers. He is in front of the Kaaba, and he is still praying four rakatas too. So this, if anywhere in the world, you shouldn't do Qasr, it should be Mecca. But, our Prophet ﷺ prays Qasr. Now obviously this is because he's the Imam. We, when we go to Mecca, we're praying behind the Imam, we will follow the Imam. But if suppose we don't pray Dhuhr in the Haram, we miss Dhuhr, we come, now we have to pray Dhuhr, we pray two rak'ah as visitors. Clear? Right? We, if we're praying by ourselves, we will pray two rak'ahs, even in the Haram. You want to pray more, pray extra nafil. But the four rak'at are all prayed to. Qasr is an established sunnah. For the musafir, for the traveler. Okay, the next fifth point. For how long? This is where the controversy occurs. There are over a dozen opinions. I have written a very lengthy article that I referenced to you online. It is called The Islamic Definition of Travel by Yasir Qadi. Just Google it. You will find a three-part series over 20 pages. Uh, but it is, inshallah, easy reading. It's simple enough. And I go over each of the opinions and the evidences. You can find this online on Muslim Matters. So I don't want to go over all of that right now. Uh, the majority opinion, the majority opinion is the uh, three day one or three and a half days uh, and the Hanafi say uh, 15 days, right? So the three madhahib, the Shafi'is, the Malikis and the Hanbalis, they say that if you want to stay beyond four days, if you want to stay four days and beyond, then you have to pray full. If you stay four days or less, right? So three days plus. So if you're staying 20 rak'at, the Hanbalis say, because that's what four days is. If you're staying 19 rak'at, you will do qasr. And if you do more than that, you will do uh, long. However, Ibn Taymiyyah argues, based upon this incident of the conquest of Mecca, that there is no time limit. That you may remain Musafir as long as you are Musafir. So there's a huge controversy over this issue. And uh, in my humble opinion, it really depends on your circumstances. If your circumstances are such that you are a traveler, and you're living like a traveler, then you may pray Qasr, but if you decide to follow the safer opinion, that is better for you. And if your circumstances are such that you are living like a temporary resident, so I've given many examples in the past, for example, your company sends you uh, for a training, and the training is one week long, and you're living in a hotel, and you're living out of a suitcase, it's clear you are a musafir, in my opinion, even if it's more than four days. And if you pray Qasr, then not a problem, you are following what the Prophet ﷺ did. However, your company sends you for a six month training somewhere. Now you have to get a car, you have to acclimatize yourself, you have to know where the you know, halal stores are, the mosque is, you have to. So you kind of settle down even though it's six months. You know it's six months, but you're not a musafir. So where is the cutoff point? There is no date cutoff point, it's a psychological frame of mind. Right? It's how you're living your life. It's what you're doing uh, and how you're living. So this is where the, the gray area comes. And if you want to err on the side of caution and follow the four-day rule, then that is better. If you want to err on the side of caution, it's a simple rule, then that is uh, better. Uh, of the fiqh positions that uh, we can derive from this uh, is converts, when they convert to Islam and their couples, the marriage contract shall remain valid regardless of who converts first for a period of time. And this is very important for converts to know. How do we know this? Because in the conquest of Mecca, we had a number of men embraced Islam, then their wives embraced after them. We also had a number of women embrace Islam and their husbands come a week or two later. Classic example is Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl. Remember he fled to Mecca. Safwan wanted to commit suicide, remember, right? He ran away and he said, Khalas, I'm not going to live anymore. His wife was the one who's like converted and begging. And so we have a number of cases of women who converted. 
First, their husbands are still pagan. Then when their husbands come back, they're not asked to do a new nikah ceremony. Right? They're not asked for a new mahr, new witnesses, no. What does this show? This shows us that when a person converts to Islam, a time frame is given. How long is that time frame? Most people say three months, idda. Three months. A time frame is given. That, uh, and th there's an ikhtilaf over the length of time. We're, we don't want to get involved right now in that. But the point being, if after this point in time, the other spouse converts, then the marriage contract, even though it was done pre-Islam, and even though for a time the two could not technically be married, so a, a, a Muslim man with a pagan lady, can we have this? No. A Muslim lady with any other man, can we have this? No. Yet in the conquest of Mecca, the both of them happened for a while. And the Prophet ﷺ allowed the marriage contracts to become uh, realized if the both eventually converted in a short time frame. And therefore from this we derive the fiqh ruling that the marriage contracts of other people who convert to Islam will be valid and remain valid after Islam uh, for a period of uh, time. Um, of the things that we learn, well we learned this from the hadith of Hind, uh, the wife of Abu Sufyan, that uh, women love this point here, women are allowed to take money from their husbands without their husband's knowledge. <laughs> like that unconditionally or what? The men are very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> what are the conditions? That's why we don't have any money. That's why we don't have any money. Okay. <laughs> what are the conditions? Remember what the conditions are here. If it's done bil ma'roof, if it's done for legitimate causes for the family that is uh, uh, that the husband is being extra stingy and it is done uh, for the cause of the family obviously wives cannot just buy a five thousand uh, dollar what is it or what is the purse name the huh what is the purse the I just found out there are purses of forty fifty thousand dollars like it's just mind-boggling like wow anyway so Wives cannot just go and charge a, a, a credit card for $50,000 purse and say, oh, I'm allowed to spend your money. No. Islam allows the wife to take her husband's money if the husband is being stingy with the family. If the husband is being stingy with the family and the needs of the family are not being met, the hadith of Hindu that we did last week, it, it clearly demonstrates, and there's a well-known principle, that the wife can then take and go grocery shopping, purchase the clothes for the kids, stuff that needs to be done, it can be done uh, without even the permission of the husband. Of the fiqh benefits we learn, is that when an item is haram, then it is haram to sell the item. When an item is najis, or filthy, or haram, we cannot make a business out of the item. And we learn this from the conquest of Mecca. Of the uh, fiqh benefits that we learn, that it is sunnah, it is mustahab to, uh, for a person, for a, an elderly man or woman that has completely white hair, what is it sunnah? Dye to dye the hair. To dye the hair. Uh, and this is, we learned this from which incident? Abu Qahafa. Abu Qahafa's conversion to Islam. Of the fiqh benefits we learn here, the permissibility of visiting Mecca uh, and entering Mecca without ihram. The permissibility of entering Mecca without ihram for a reason. Now this is a bit of a controversy amongst the scholars. Some say that this was only for the Prophet ﷺ, but others say no. And the reason they say this is because imagine going to Mecca for a reason other than Umrah or Hajj. They feel this is not befitting. And wallahi, I understand this, but at the same time, think of those people whose businesses involve things in Mecca. Think of taxi drivers between Jeddah and Mecca. Think of fruit sellers that purchase their stuff in Ta'if and then come and sell it in Mecca. Right? Think of the people there. Don't think of us in Memphis. It is a big shame if one of you were to go to Mecca for any reason and not do Umrah and Tawaf. Correct? That is honestly pathetic. After spending so much money and you want to have a business transaction with somebody in Mecca, la hawla la illa billah. We say you have lost the plot. But somebody who's going to Mecca five times a day, five times a week, whatever, and the taxi drivers between Jeddah and Mecca go ten times a day. So alhamdulillah they can use this incident of conquest of Mecca to say it is not mandatory to do tawaf and umrah, sorry, yeah, to do tawaf and umrah every time you enter Mecca, it's not mandatory to wear ihram. Because how did the Prophet enter Mecca? 
He was wearing the armor. He wasn't wearing ihram. And uh, of the, fi uh, the final point we'll mention here uh, about the fiqh benefits is that some scholars have derived from this, and this is a bit of a controversy again in fiqh, the scholars of fiqh, breaking one condition of a treaty is tantamount to breaking the entire treaty. Because how did the Prophet ﷺ conquer Mecca in the first place? The Quraysh broke one of the clauses. When they broke one of the clauses, the Prophet ﷺ considered the entire treaty null and void. Okay, so this is another point that is derived. As for the theological benefit, then it is pretty obvious. Uh, it is pretty obvious what the theological benefit is. And that is that uh, in the end, victory will always be on the side of the truth. In the end, al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen, victory will always be given to those who have taqwa. Uh, the theological benefit is obvious. Allah says in the Quran, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَأَغْلِبَنَّ أَنَا وَرُسُلِي your Lord has decreed that He shall always be victorious in the end. In fact, He doesn't even speak in the second person. Allah says, Your Lord has decreed, I shall be victorious along with my prophets and messengers. And this conquest of Mecca clearly shows, of course, we as Muslims obviously believe this to be a miracle. And truly, it is a miracle for us. Yani after... Uh, the persecution of Mecca after being expelled, after an assassination attempt, for him to come back, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in eight years and to conquer the capital of the Arabian Peninsula without any war, without any bloodshed, a peaceful conquest, which was simply, I mean, it truly is an amazing point here. And then this conquest to precipitate the entire embracing of Islam, of the Arabian Peninsula, obviously for Muslims, this is a divine gift from Allah. It is demonstrating that when you're patient, when you persevere, when you do not falter in the path of Allah, eventually Allah will reward you with the victory at the end. Our Prophet ﷺ demonstrates this, the ups and the downs. And frankly, most of the seerah so far has been the downs. Right? So much we have talked about. You must suffer in the path of Allah before you will get the rewards. Even the prophets have to put in the effort. Nobody gets the reward sitting at home and thinking Allah is just going to throw the blessing down at him. You have to stand up and strive. You have to do what you can. You have to show Allah your dedication, your strength, your determination, and you will suffer. How much has our Prophet ﷺ suffered? How many battles have been fought? How many loved ones have died? We just talked about the battle of Mu'tah recently, that the Prophet ﷺ himself is in shock and he's crying, and he's lost so many of his loved ones. But in the end, when you put in the sweat and the toil and the effort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never causes the efforts of the righteous to go unrewarded. And we see this in the conquest of uh, Mecca. After all of these difficult years, our Prophet ﷺ is rewarded with the greatest victory imaginable, and that is the return of the holy city of Mecca to its rightful uh, owners, and that is the descendant of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Insha'Allah, in our next uh, lesson, we will continue from where we left off and talk about the incident of Hunayn and Al-Ta'if. And before we conclude, there are some announcements to be made.